sure I don't mix them up on you. That's some confusion. This particular um, <coughs> motorcycle tire that we were talking about might be a bit of an example of two tires that are uh, kind of close but differ a bit. So we've got a ruler over there. Yeah, I was saying like over on this one, over let's say up to this point here, uh, which is including one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of these tips. It's well, let's go one, two, three pitch lines. It's Twenty-eight millimeters, and on this one. One, two, three. Okay, and then we got we got twenty. Looks like we got about twenty two oh, millimeters, two hundred and sixty nine, two hundred sixty eight. What do we have on this one? 268, yeah. Okay, on this one we got 253 millimeters. So they're they're close, but they're not that close. They're, this one's quite a bit shorter if you're going by millimeters over. The longer, the further you go, the more it multiplies the difference. So that's an example of where you might want to take a test impression off uh, the two tires and compare the two and see if one fits better than the other. Although when we did the uh, when we did the test impression on the, on the motorcycle, it fit like a glove over the crime scene impression, like it fit perfectly. Um, but it didn't fit exactly over this this drawing, okay? Uh, that we've got there because this is done for this is a drawing of the mold of the tire uninflated. I mean, not under load. So that would be like a model of the tire. So this is longer, actually longer, than the impression roller. The same thing uh, uh, with the molds. The tire companies have told me, these molds here, measurements on here won't be necessarily exactly the same as what you'll get from a test impression. Because that's for looking at the model or at the mold that doesn't have any uh, distortion or weight on it from rolling. So don't expect uh, measurements in the, these drawings to be exactly the same. Now, with respect to the BF Goodrich Trailmaker, take a quick look at that. Now, let's see if I can get this nice and straight. Okay, there was a name model, and you saw the lugs changed in size for that model. Okay, in the A model, it had the smallest bug of all. They went from large to smaller. Then B model had a different lug sequence as well. Good layout. Um, also notice there I noticed there were lug holes for studs. And then the C model once again was different. Something like the look for the snow, for the mud and snow tire. So once again, we've got a different pitch sequence. Now, as far as the arrangement of those around the tire, that's what we had. There, I fly that. Can we put that right on? Okay, so we've got A, B, and a C model. And then they were arranged in this order, starting here. A, B, A, B, C, B, A, B, A. And then uh, we've got a little different arrangement for the female half. This is the male half. Now, when you did your search, there was one area that fit the best. And maybe not perfectly, but if you looked at everything and took everything into consideration, that would be the most likely area. And that has a C model in it. There's only one C model around the circumference, so that's why it only fits in that one place that well. 
If it had to come from an area like here, B, A would have fit in one, two, three, four areas. And then you would have had to use where or something to try and decide which is the best spot. Okay, so this is the type of example if you have two tires like this on the rear of the vehicle. You may find that it will only fit once on the left side when you do your comparison because you picked up a bit of a C model. And then when you do the right rear tire, you'll find it fits one, two, three, three times. A, B, A, B, A, B. So here you've got a situation where you're going to have three places to deal with on the right rear, but only one to concentrate on in the left. If it happens to come from an area A, A, it's only going to fit in one spot. So there was two places on that tire where we could have flipped on to where we'd only have one area where it would fit. <coughs> the other one, it's going to be a little hard to see the pit sequence on this one. That's why I gave the mold drawings to look at a bit, but this is an example of the Firestone 721 steel belted radio. A pitch sequence made up of three pitches. One, two, and a three. And the pitch sequence, uh, one is the smallest, two gets a little bigger, and three is 1.724 inches. This pitch sequence here, we found right here in P1. Two ones, two twos, and two threes. There is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten models on that side and ten on this side, a total of 20 models. Each model has a, has a pitch sequence of its own. So with only three little pitch sequences, they came up with quite a complicated arrangement of pitches to produce a quiet running tire. So when you search that one, you only found one spot again that matched. You know, there were other areas that were close, but there was one you liked the best, and that was because it was not a repeating pit sequence. So sometimes when you're doing a search and you find a spot, you don't have the mold drawings, you find a spot that fits well, fits good, and that's the spot you like, and it doesn't appear to fit anywhere else, you can mark that spot and then take your transparency off, put a piece of plastic over and do a tracing of that area, nice neat tracing, something you can see through really good and slide that area along back and forth very carefully and, and you'll be able to tell very easily whether there's another area that's repeating or not or, or that's close you can see through a nice clear plastic tracing better and if you can't find another spot that fits you'll be able to say with confidence that there isn't another area that's uh, going to fit that closely any other questions on that Okay, we'll turn on the lights. Okay, that's uh, that's all we're going to cover for today. It is to use uh, some of the exhibits that you prepare. You've gone to the trouble to make a test impression and the transparency, full size photograph. That's a good way of demonstrating how you reach your conclusions. So it helps to have a table, a long table like this that you can put out in the corner. <coughs> fit your pieces together. So you'd need a table a little bit longer than this. You could explain that to the prosecutor. Fit everything together for demonstration purposes. Show the jury. Explain a little bit about um, uh, tire design. Basically, I wouldn't get too involved in it, but I'd explain that uh, manufacturers have a noise treatment built into the tread design. That all the elements that you can see on this test impression are not the same size. They're changing in size and they're in a certain sequence which has been set by the engineers who designed that tread. And the reason that they change the size of these is to quiet the tire down. If they were all the same size, the tire would be very noisy, so they arranged them in a certain order to quiet the tire down. That's a simple explanation and the term is noise treatment or pitch sequence. This is something that is in all modern radio tires, all passenger tires have it. And I would explain that uh, it's useful in the comparison purposes when you're trying to decide whether the tire at the crime scene is consistent with the tire on a suspect vehicle. And the way you would use it is to see if you can produce a photograph and a transparency of that 
photograph or cast. And see if you can slide it along and find an area where the size of these elements in the crime scene impression is in the same sequence somewhere in this test impression. And if you can find an area that's very close, it doesn't have to fit exactly because we're uh, dealing with a hard flat surface here and a somewhat uneven surface with a cast or a crime scene impression. If it's on a hard flat surface like the floor, it should fit very closely. Uh, so there can be a certain amount of leeway, but what is important is that the sequence and the order of these uh, ranging, getting larger and smaller is in agreement. So there could be a little bit of play, as you found out yesterday from doing your comparison, by having to move it back or forth a quarter of an inch or so, um, or depending on uh, whether you have problems with your ruler getting things to scale. You might have a little bit of problem, but nevertheless, you should be able to visually look at the size of these and look at these and see that there, there's an agreement there, they're getting larger and smaller in the same order. That's the thing, that's the key that I'd like to keep in mind. Because sometimes you can find more than one spot that fits very closely, as you found yesterday. And with the transparency over top, it can be a little bit confusing. So make sure that you lift it up and down like this and go from one element to the next and look to see that they're in the right order. Um, so I would use a demonstration like this right in court and, and have everything marked like I have here. This is the area, this is one area that fits closely, and this is another area in the tire that fits. I've got it numbered 1, 2 through to 11. I've got the cast number 1 to 11 goes in the opposite order because the tire would go down like that onto it. Now uh, you can explain why the order runs in reverse if you have a situation like that. And I have the transparency numbered 1 to 11. So all I really am doing here is I'm laying the numbers over top. And you can explain that so that somebody else can do the same thing as you did. And when I do that, I've located the spot where this transparency is in agreement. So I can explain here that I've got the consistency of size and design. So this tire here could have made this cast impression. As far as uh, other things like wear, I've indicated them here, um, site wear, and also right on this drawing, the red line, I've indicated that uh, the site, size of this element or the size of the site showing up in the cast is in, in agreement here, which helped me pinpoint it as this being the proper area. Okay, so everything's marked, uh, you, you could mark on this plastic and uh, demonstrate some things. Now, if you've made a positive identification, if there's accidental characteristics there, I think you're better to then make a full-size photograph of the cast, take a photograph of this area, make a full-size photograph, one-to-one -one of that, and photograph the area on the tire, which would be section 1-2, and make a one-to-one -one photograph of that. Now, the tire's curved, so you know there's going to be a bit of problem there as far as the length goes. You can explain that. And then, to demonstrate positive identification with, with uh, individualizing or class accidental characteristics, use chart of crime scene impression, the test impression, and the tire mark. Hold on to the tire, have the tire available in court, show them on the tire where section one and two is. We've got it marked here, it's very easy for people to find. Mark cuts in the tire. So you can use a chalk or a piece of tape or something to isolate the area and then try and have sticky markers on there to show where the cuts are. So that's how I would demonstrate the evidence in court. If it's not, like I said, a positive identification or you're not saying that that's the only tire that can make the impression, then these test impressions, transparency and photograph is, should be sufficient, I think. <coughs> So that is a, a professional way, I think, to demonstrate the evidence in court and explain. And if you're, um, like I said yesterday, make sure that you're, you're clear and concise on what your opinion is in court. Make sure there's no confusion on what you're saying so that the jury understands whether you feel that uh, you have the right size and design. Make, make sure they know whether you think that the wear is consistent, and that would certainly eliminate a lot of tires that were more newer or older. 
and also if it's a, if it's not a positive identification, make that clear before you leave the stand. I think that's important. So does that cover that pretty good, Steve? Yeah. Thank you. So there's your stuff to go to court. Yeah. Can you uh, go over how you make try your transparencies? Okay. The transparency is is um, very simple to make. The key to making one of these is having a large tray that this will fit in and having the Kodak transparent film. This, I used to make these with Kodalith ortho film, but I don't think you can get Kodalith ortho in the large size anymore. I may stand corrected, but our photographic lab in Ottawa told me that they are now using Kodak transparent film. And that was the last product that I used to make these, and it works very well. The, um, the translucent type film with a bit of a matte finish does not work. Okay? It's transparent, but it's got a, a matte finish. If anybody's used that, you have to have something that, that uh, when you uh, clear it in the uh, fix, goes totally clear in the background. So it's a matter of in the in the in dark room, putting the negative in the enlarger, getting it high enough to project a one-to-one -one size photograph, and make a photograph with uh, photographic paper. And this is probably a 16 by 20 size, but it comes in 18 by 24 as well. So you project on to the photographic paper, and I developed it in Dectol, Kodak Dectol developer, and then a stop bath, and a minute and a half in the Dectol, stop bath for, for one minute, 15 seconds to one minute, and then uh, about three minutes or so in the fix, three to four, whatever the manufacturer recommends for, for fixing the film. And then it's washed. Now, for the transparency, I take a small strip, test strip of the film because it's expensive, and I put it in and I reduce the uh, f-stop from, if it was f8, to get an exposure on this, I reduce the f-stop to um, go to f11, I cut down one stop. Because this stuff I found was about, the transparent film was about one stop faster, one to two stops faster. So I do my test strip, I develop it, take it out, see what it looks like, and if it looks good, then that's what I go with, and I'll stick a full sheet in, project onto it, refocus and everything, although I found the thickness of this stuff is about the same as uh, photographic papers, it's not much of a problem in refocusing. Then that's developed in Dectol as well for the same amount of time as the paper. Washed and hung to drip dry. I didn't bother using photo flow on it, although you could, but I found it drip dries pretty clean. And then you've got a transparent photograph. Norman, I noticed you don't take the cast tape. Is that because actually the photograph is actually easier to read for? Oh, uh, the, photo, the photograph, I don't take the cast into court, you yeah. say? Um, that was just a... An oversight on my part. I would take the cast to court. Oh, you would. But you would use the photograph for comparison. Yeah, for doing a chart up uh, to draw lines to, I would use um, I would use a photograph of the cast, yeah, to draw the lines to. I think that would be an easy way. And then actually have the cast and the tire there as well, so that you have the the uh, spots marked on the cast as well, where the cuts are in the cast. Because actually the cuts will show up much better on the cast than they will on the uh, photograph. Now I don't know how well casting will work here. It's going to depend on your uh, soil, like a real sandy impression. Um, I haven't had a whole lot of experience in casting real sandy soil. I have done casts in it and they tend to come out a little grainy, pebbles in the sand. But uh, nevertheless, it's probably still going to be useful to cast. It was three-dimensional, size is there and everything. But I, I think if you do some test, you'll learn through experience just how well that's going to work. Certainly, if you have any clay mixed in with your sand, uh, that type of soil, it's excellent results. Wait, did you say that you uh, put a little fine mist of powder? Yes. Okay. Uh, talcum powder, baby powder, actually. Or, you know, there's another product called parting uh, powder, which is used at foundries. You, if you sprinkle that over your impression first, a light dusting on it, you'll probably find that there'll be less sticking to it. And then 
Who uh, mentioned the method of washing the cast here, which forces the dirt off? Craig? And what was that again? Potassium sulfate potassium concentrated sulfate. solution. Concentrated solution of potassium sulfate, and you dip the cast right in it? Yes, and it starts bubbling. The air gets forced out. Forces the air out, and then the surface gets clean. So there's a good technique. That doesn't affect any of your, your little real fine accident? He, no, he showed us the results. It was very detailed. Okay, I think we'll um, show some slides now. So we'll cut the lights back. I'll get this down. And I want to show you some slides on direction of travel now. <coughs> okay, now I'm just going to find the point here. This again. We mentioned uh, about right and left side of the vehicle. If, if you can say that a certain tire design is on the right side of the vehicle and another different patterns on the left side, probabilities are certainly greater if there's a combination of tires. The probabilities of another vehicle matching increases with the location and the number of different patterns on a vehicle because there's so many tires available on the market today. So it's very important that you determine when you're photographing a tire, if you can, that you're dealing with the right side or left side of the vehicle. And one of the ways to do that is to try and figure out the direction of travel that the that the tire is rolling in when you're at the scene, whether the vehicle is backing up, driving forward, and where the front of the vehicle is. Well, that last slide showed you direction of travel, and we'll just go back to the previous slide for a second. Right here, this, these are just indicating little bits of dirt being lifted. Earth lifted in direction, wheel is rolling on damp soil. And this next slide, it shows uh, muddy, damp soil, and the vehicle is rolling in that direction. You can see little chunks of dirt were lifted in the direction of travel. So the dirt, soil gets compressed, and then as the pressure is released by the tire, it tends to lift it a bit. Now with sandy soil, I've noticed that there's, in damp sandy soil, you get cracks, and the cracks, uh, the incline uh, going into the sandy soil is in sloping in like that. Or if this is the soil here and the vehicle's traveling that direction, the crack will slope in that way. Okay? I'll show you close up. Here we go. A little piece of uh, dirt which has been compressed and then lifted lifted up. So the crack here, the angle goes down in that way. So the uh, vehicle is traveling towards the Yep. The vehicle the vehicle's rolling that way. Yeah, the wheel is rolling this way, and, it, and the vehicle is traveling that direction. Now, if the vehicle was rolling this way, that would be flattened and lifted the other way. So you can see another little crack here. And it's lifted up slightly. You flattened it down, and it would fit right back into that spot. Now, if you notice that, and you've got a vehicle at the scene yourself, you can do a little test yourself right at the scene. In, a, in another area that won't damage the tracks, you can drive in the direction that you know, you know, the direction of traveling already because you made the tracks, and then take a look at the soil and see what you see. And say, yep, yeah, that's what's happening. So that's uh, that's one way to figure out direction of travel. So if the vehicle's traveling that way, leaving the scene, you can, you can tell that that's the right side of the vehicle, and if there's another track over here, it'll be the left side. Now, the same thing kind of happens with snow. I noticed that uh, you know it's, this is all stacked. So these, the, and if the vehicle was rolling this way, that would be pressed down and stacked up the other way. So you kind of get that cracking effect or stacking of the snow behind the tire as it rolls that way through as well. Now, if you've got any plant material and uh, the tire tracks are back here, you're photographing on a sandy soil but the vehicle drives and turns around in an area where there's some plants that you can roll them out and flatten them in the direction of travel. So this stuff's all been flattened that way. So sometimes it requires following the tracks for a little ways and making some observations. So the more little clues you get, the more confident you are in your opinion. In other words, you've got those cracks in the soil, then you see some planted material. So now I know that the 
tires traveling that way. This is another example of the same thing. This is just stubble from a crop in a field, and the vehicle drove through, and you can see these things haven't rebounded yet. They're still bent in the direction of travel. So that's the direction of travel the wheel? Yeah. This is the vehicle traveling that way, flattening these down. Okay? So the tire was rolling this way. Okay? And it, and it hit these things. The tire comes down, hits it, and knocks it down. So the vehicle's traveling that way. Um, this is a, an area where you stop and take a look at things. You don't just rush right in and start taking photographs. Pass <laughs> there. Yeah. Now, um, sometimes you can tell whether the vehicle has been there once or twice. And it might look a little confusing, but if you, if you get a call to go to a scene and there's tire tracks there, probably the first thing you want to do is just tell them to stay away from that area, mark it off. I think probably that's a standard procedure because you're going to have to take a look at things yourself. Now, um, from this, you see this tire here, it pivoted on the spot, there's a really wide angle here. That's an indication of the front tire, once again, right here. Any tire that comes in and all of a sudden reverses its direction and changes sharply like that with a big angle here, that's an indication of the front tire. Now, the rear tires, they have a much uh, smaller angle when they come in and out. That, uh, you know, it doesn't show up all that well here, but the angle isn't as great for the rear tire. So let's take a look at this. This would be a front tire coming in, stopping, going back, like that. So the, this track runs over top of this one coming in. So this was the last one made. So this one must have come in first, stop. And the person must have cut their tires and backed up here, backed up to here and stopped again. And then this tire must have driven forward, the front tire, and the rear tires came on the top last of all. So the last tires are the rear tires. So we've got a vehicle coming in, stopping, backing up, stopping, and driving off. So wheelbase. And right here, and right here, there's the rear tire. So that's the left side. Then front tire, stop, wheelbase, from right here to right here. That's how long the vehicle was. Track width, center to center, across there. Rear track width, center to center, across there. Now, the person drove back and stopped there, drove back and stopped there, drove back and stopped here, backed up and stopped there. So you've got another wheelbase from here to here, and here to here. So actually, you could get four measurements on the wheelbase there, take an average of all four, and that's going to be probably pretty darn accurate. <coughs> um, here's an example of a, an angle. Well, a vehicle came in here, right, and then this track overlaps, so it's going out that way. So that's the direction of travel, going out that way. It came in here and out there, because this is over the top. And the angle isn't very sharp here. And the tire hasn't pivoted or turned on the spot, so that's a rear tire. So the uh, person would have driven in here, stopped, and then backed up. And here's the front tire going up. Uh, making a big turn in the field. Um, the, the rear tires always make the smallest uh, arc, or, or the shortest circumference. They track to the inside of the front tires. So this is going to be a rear tire. This is a front, this is a rear, and this is a front. So the largest sweeping arc will be the front tires on the turn. The rear tires will track to the inside. Now let's go back to that last slide just for a second. Also, if a vehicle is traveling fairly quickly like that, and it's hitting uh, a puddle, it will splash water ahead, mud. And uh, even though the water will be dry, the mud stain might still be there. If it's soil, it will often throw soil in the direction of travel. If you can see the soil thrown in the direction of travel, kind of spray it ahead a bit, it would flatten the material, plant material here. 
So you'd be able to tell this vehicle is traveling in that direction. It's throwing debris and it's flattening some of this plant material. So you'd be able to tell that's the left rear, left front, right rear, right front. But that's not true when you, once you start spinning, right? Well, once you start spinning, that's this situation, okay? These tires are spinning and then all of a sudden they're grabbing as the tire makes traction and travels off in that direction. So the spinning tire, throwing the stuff back this way, right, that's a different situation. So that indicates direction travel that way. Now it's important sometimes to determine whether it's the front tires that are spinning or the rear tires. Because 50% of the vehicles today are front wheel drive roughly, I'll just to say approximately, and about half of them are rear wheel drive. There's getting to be a lot of front wheel drive vehicles now. So that could be critical. But be careful when you're doing that an analyzing front or rear wheel drive. You know, unless you're absolutely sure. Make sure it's not just a scuff mark from the, from the brakes locking and scuffing. This is striations in the side of a trench that somebody's driven through. So which way is that tire running? Towards you. Towards me, exactly. That wheel is rolling this way because as the wheel uh, makes contact with the side of the trench, it makes striations that curve like that. So the tire is turning that way and the vehicle is rolling this way. Now, I haven't covered all, all the factors here. I'm sure there may be others that you may notice yourself when you're at a scene. But this is just an awareness, some little clues that can help you from guessing the wrong side of the vehicle. Next. Okay, this is um, blood transfer like I had yesterday in that underground parking lot. So um, you drive through some blood, and every time the tire makes a revolution, it gets fainter in the direction of travel. And it also give you approximate center to center for the circumference of the tire. The tire itself may be a directional design. Uh, like some of the designs on the high-performance radial tires now on Corvettes and uh, Toyota Nissan high-performance vehicles or Porsches, anything like that. They usually have an arrow, or sometimes have an arrow on the side telling you which side of the, that arrow, when the, when the tire's at the top of its cycle, that arrow has to point to the front of the vehicle. And that tells which direction to mount the tire or which side to mount the tire on. The V has to point in an impression when you look at the impression, the V tendency of the pattern will point to the rear of the vehicle. I mentioned that the first day. Now with respect to uh, wheelbase, I mentioned that briefly and I have some overheads to cover as well. The wheelbase is the center on the front axle to the center of the rear, perpendicular distance established by the manufacturer. The track width set by the manufacturer for a vehicle when the vehicle is properly aligned is the center of the tire on one side on the same axle to the center of the tire on the other side. That's the track width. The front and rear track width often vary, sometimes considerable amount, sometimes less. The turning diameter is the, uh, there's two types of turning diameter. There's uh, wall to wall and curve to curve. Okay, now, this is not the turning diameter you want for the front bumper. That would be, if it, if it was confined, would the pump, bumper strike anything uh, over a, or under a certain uh, diameter of an arc that can be made? Uh, we want the uh, curve to curve diameter, which is for the tire, the outside tire making the turn. So the outside front here, tire and the vehicle is turning this way. So the turning diameter is uh, the tightest turn that can be made by that vehicle. Here's an example of some tire tracks where a vehicle has. Um, take a look at um, got it going up this way. Okay. So the vehicle has driven in here, stopped, driven in here and stopped, cut the tires, 
really hard. I'm backed up this way. So the front tire is the last one. So you see the big arc made here? Couldn't, couldn't happen with the rear tire. So you know for sure, right front, left front, right rear, left front. So you can pick your best spots there, photograph and cast, and figure out uh, your direction of travel from that. We're going to be doing this outside today. We're going to be measuring, uh, and I'll show you uh, after some tests we did. Stick to the inside edge of the rear tire and the inside edge of the front. And then the same thing on the opposite side, the inside edge, the inside edge. And the track width is measured from the center to the center. So try and uh, count the number of ribs. One, two, three, four, five. So you have to decide where the center of the tire is. Uh, somewhere right in around here. Okay, so we've got a center rib. So it's got to be right in the middle of this rib. So we're using metric. Looks like it's one, four, four, five. Okay, so that's one thousand four hundred and forty-five millimeters. So get it as accurately as you can. If it looks like it's um, 58 and 3 eighths inches, then write down 58 and 3 eighths. Don't round it off to 58 and a half or something like that. Try and be as precise as you can. That's just a measurement of the arc width. A useful measurement you can get. It's worth recording. The arc width sometimes, if you go to a tire dealership, they'll be able to tell you what size tire you're looking for. Yeah, just from the width of the tire. So you give them a measurement. Now, after we're finished, uh, what I'd like you to do is measure the vehicle. We'll measure them after, not before. Measure the uh, center to the center for our wheelbase, and then we're going to measure our track width. So, right there, 2.4. Go right to the center of the hub. It's going to be close, not perfect, because you. If you've got the tire sidewalls bulging out a little bit, or you know, the tape might not be perfectly straight. And that's just a slide of the, somebody taking the measurement for the tire. Once again, when I measure, when you run a tape right around for the circumference, expect it to be a little bit longer than your test impression. When you get a situation like that, it's very difficult to measure wheelbase because it's something in mud. So if it sinks in, not so much at the back, but it does at the front. You know, if you go all the way up to here, you're riding up the tire a bit. You're going to get longer, a longer wheelbase than, there, than it actually is. So you have to be aware of that. Um, you might have to come down here somewhere if you want to estimate it. What you do is you take a look at how much the rear tire has sunk in. You put a, if you put a ruler in there and it's sunk in two inches, at the rear, you go to the base here, measure up about two inches from the flattest spot, and then project the line along roughly parallel two inches and you'll, and you'll have the spot here. Follow what I mean? That will give you an approximate. I mean, it's not going to be perfect. You may be out uh, two or three inches. Okay, we'll turn on the lights then. Okay, so uh, that's some information on uh, measuring <coughs> wheelbase and track width. And it basically, uh, forensic evidence that can uh, help the investigator. You can get the same vehicle, I mean, you can get different vehicles with the same tire on them. In other words, um, that tire that I have in mind, the Goodyear GT Plus 4, you could find that tire on a Pontiac Transport SE van, or you can find it on a Honda Accord. And if all you've recorded is the tire impression, and both these vehicles are happen to be suspect vehicles, you wouldn't be able to eliminate one or the other necessarily. But if you've recorded the wheelbase and track width, the vehicles could vary so much that you'd be able to say, this one's very close, 
this is likely the vehicle, the other one isn't. So that's the value in reporting this. Also, um, in the past, um, lots of times when measurements like that were recorded, they weren't really of much value until a suspect vehicle was located. And then you measured the vehicle to see how close you were. But now, uh, with computers, the way they are being able to search reams of data quickly and give you a printout of vehicles that match closely, you know, we're able to do that. In the past, it meant like going to car dealers, looking through books. It was just about an impossible task. You tell an investigator when he asked you, well, what vehicles could have made those tracks? What's really close to it? They're not asking you to tell them, you know, what the vehicle was. They're just saying, can you give me some idea of what vehicle might have made that? Now, with the computer, so you can give them a printout and say, these are close. And you'll notice the handout that I gave you. Um, and I see uh, yours for a second. <coughs> Back, we've got, I think in there I have a form. No, oh, maybe, maybe we haven't given that out yet. Okay, I'll give that out right now. We don't have it in there yet. Okay, I have a, an example of a computer printout for a search we did uh, on an actual case. At the top, we've got the search windows, plus or minus how much we went. And then we've got, do not restrict yourself to these vehicles. The actual suspect vehicle may not be on this list. Okay, that, and that is because the vehicle may have been modified. The uh, rear end suspension may have been changed. It may be way out of alignment. Um, the tires may have been changed in the rims. So, or else it could have been in there in the measurements of the crime scene. I don't know if somebody read the tape wrong, and there's a number of possibilities. Or the vehicle may not be in the database. It might be a new vehicle that's not on there yet. It might be an older kind of oddball vehicle that year they didn't get the specs for. It. So Michigan State Police have this program. Roger Bullhouse of the Michigan State Police in East Lansing, Michigan, uh, is your contact person if you want to do a vehicle track search. Call them, and uh, they have no objections to handling your request for you. So I'll hand this out and give you an example of what a search request looks like. specifications that were published. But make sure when you get the suspect vehicle that you actually measure the vehicle. Because the measurements you took at the crime scene might be closer to the vehicle than they are to this list, to what this list says. Because the vehicle might have some alignment problems, which may, means it's varying from the manufacturer's specs. And what you recorded at the crime scene might actually be closer. So in other words, um, uh, practice is to always measure the vehicle. When you measure the vehicle uh, for the track width, make sure that you measure down low to the ground, not higher up in the tire because of the camber. Okay, if the vehicle is cambered, the tires are cambered like that, and you measure up higher here, it's going to narrow, right? If you measure down here, it's closer to what you get on the ground. So try and get down, you have to get on your knees, throw down a, a small cloth or blanket to kneel on, get the tape way down there. Do not put the vehicle up on a hoist to measure the track width, because when the camber's like that, as soon as you put the vehicle up on a hoist, the tire fall, falls straight, and it'll throw your measurement off. So you've got to do it when the vehicle's come to a rolling stop. So once you've measured the vehicle, you'll have that. And this is an article that uh, published in the RCMP Gazette, and I have enough copies of this to give each of you one. So everything we're going to be talking about today on vehicle track identification measurement at a crime scene, pretty well covered it and written it up here. Yes? Uh, a lot of the, the books that I've read indicate for track width, inside to outside, outside to inside, you're mm -hmm. saying center to center. Does it really matter? Or 
do you suggest doing several? Um, I suggest you can do you can do it three ways if you want. But sometimes what happens is um, I will say that from tests I did, I found center to center is the most accurate. Now the problem with outside to outside when you get uh, a ball of wire on the outside edge. I told you that. Lou. Yeah, I know. That's only <laughs> firing some test shots That's in the nice. tank behind us. As long as they don't shoot it through the wall, and <laughs> shoot me in the back, palm duck. As this tire wears down, it, it gets really hard to pick the edge sometimes, the outside edge. So it's uh, that's the problem with you going edge to edge. What if you happen to have a tire that's really worn like this on one side, and fairly sharp and clean on the other? You're measuring edge to edge. So it could introduce a small error, but it's usually possible to pick the very center of the pattern, even if you just. Um, Stand back and use a ruler and after you've done your forecast and go down and place it visually right in the center. You'll probably get dead center because your eye is pretty accurate like that. But whenever you've got a groove right down the middle, it makes it real easy, or a rib right down the center. You just pick the very center of that rib. So you can go, okay, center to center. Now I've got some stuff before you can go outside to outside. Now sometimes you have to go inside to outside. Or you can go um, the other way around, or you can go outside to outside. <coughs> then you've got to add the width of one of these tires. Or subtract the width when you go outside to outside. You've got to subtract the width of one of these tires, and you'll get the equivalent of center to center. Or you can go inside to inside, plus the width of one of these tires will give you. But when you have a tire that's wider on one side than the other, you get a, an older vehicle that's a clunker, and the guy's got a narrow tire on one side and a wide one on the other, that's going to be a bit of a problem, right? So then you've got to add the two tires together, figure out the average of the two tires, and take half of that. So the simplest thing to do whenever possible is to go center to center, because that is the measurement that the manufacturer has. So, you know, rather than uh, do any calculations, you may as well measure exactly what he measures whenever possible. Now, sometimes you can't do that. <coughs> Sometimes you have the front tire like this and the rear tires like this. Okay, and then you've got the pattern of the tire like that. And you can't see the center, maybe, because, uh, let me just show you something like this because the center has been kind of destroyed and there's just a little bit of the rear or the front tire sticking out on the edge and you can see where it stopped. So that's a case where you'd have to do that on the other side. You've got a similar situation where the tire is just sticking out a little bit. So that's a case where you, you have to go like that. Okay. One thing that I learned that I didn't know was that uh, you, if you have both front and back, you need to measure both front and back because they're different as far as track width. But they may be different. The front yes. being yes. more narrow or on some vehicles, like there's a three inch difference. On others, there's a half an inch. That's all. You know, or, or, or some vehicles are <coughs> virtually the same. So it does vary. Yeah. But whenever possible, you want to try and uh, record the front and back. How much of an error is introduced with you know, reverse rims? Um, that I don't know, but I know one thing: it'll throw it'll throw the measurements right off. So, you know, you're that's a case where if you did a search and somebody's reversed the rims and widened it up quite a bit, we wouldn't get the vehicle showing up. In some cases, we won't get it. And um, when you get your vehicle, it's not on the list. You measure it, and, it, and it's actually close to what you did get. You can explain it. You know, you can explain why it's not the same. If you observe this, it's got reverse rims, and you can say, I've actually measured this vehicle on the top manufacturer specification, but it happens to be very close to what I measured at the scene. It won't ruin your measurements that you recorded at the scene, but it'll ruin you probably your opportunity for getting it on this list. So, even a, a, you know, a badly cambered vehicle that's widened up quite a bit could, could give you a miss. The alignment is way out of whack. So um, we've got some 
forms here that I'm going to hand out. This is just uh, an example of a form. Now this isn't all inclusive of this topic, it's just some suggestions and ideas for you. And uh, same thing with the article. But this is a form for a crime scene tire vehicle track form. Just a few things to fill out as a reminder for you. And on the back it's got a few notes there that uh, feel free to copy this form if you want or make one modification of your own. Just pass that around, Kathy. And then I uh, made up a little form for suspect vehicle examination when you recover the suspect vehicle. Just a few little things to fill out. Now the reason I did this is so that I didn't forget to do something. Because you've got a lot on your mind and all of a sudden you're driving back and or the vehicle's, you know, miles away and you've, uh, next day you're looking at your court and saying, oh my gosh, I forgot to check the spare tire. You know, I wanted to check that so in case I was asked in court. Or else, um, I forgot to record the manufacturer's serial number on, the, on one of the tires. That's all it's for. So you can look at this thing and say, yeah, I think I've got everything. So these are the things that I think is probably really important to try and get. And we are going to do a vehicle track experiment. This is a form uh, that we're going to fill out today. We're going to take a vehicle and we're going to go out there and we're going to make tracks in some sandy soil. And I'm going to just get you to measure the wheelbase on the inner edge here. Forget about the outer and the middle. That's something you can do for yourself if you want to experiment with it sometime. But we're going to measure from inside edge to inside edge for the wheelbase. In the corner of the tire. And also, we'll do uh, front and rear track width, and then we'll, we'll measure the vehicle, and then we'll come back and run it through the computer. Now, how many of these do we have? We need a few more of these. Um, can you make... Um, okay. One, two. I wanted to have a where a young girl was killed in British Columbia, and the vehicle came to a screeching stop and slid off onto the shoulder. And the right rear and the right front tire stopped and left a little trench mark and dug into the shoulder of the road. So the investigators measured a wheelbase off of that, that they were quite confident they had a wheelbase. They had no track width and no wheelbase for the left side. So we ran that through the computer. Of course, we got responses for them but we don't know if it's right or not. But the thing is, uh, it's it's an investigative lead. We gave them a list of some vehicles, and all they got to do is tell the investigators, look, it might not be this, but it might be too. And, and when they've got nothing to go on, sometimes just that little lead could, could be one of those vehicles, and it might be just enough to solve it. So here's a, here's a blank one that you, you don't have to use up. This, this is your spare to say, in case you want to do this again at your department. So we're going to be working in teams today. Uh, we two. Oh yeah. Or you two. Now the, the only thing I caution you today is to try and very carefully record the measurements. Look at the tape and read it carefully. Don't accidentally write the wrong number down. If it's 57 and a quarter inches, make sure that that's what you get. And if you don't accidentally write 54 and a quarter or something like that, just, that will throw a lot of confusion into the whole exercise. We're going to, we're going to do it on the sandy uh, driveway that runs behind the building here. We've got an area there where I think we can squeeze four vehicles in and stop and turn sideways and back out of it. And then there's another sandy lot where we can go and do the turning diameter exercise. Here's a copy of the Gazette, which is a company in Europe, Conti General now. They're, they're amalgamated. They have come up with a similar tire already. It's not quite the same as that one, but it looks, looks a bit with that center group. Yeah, That's called the Aquatray. Yeah. Have you seen a commercial on TV? Yeah, they do the morphing? Yeah, the Tiger. Yeah, it almost looks like the morphing in uh, Terminator yeah. 2. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it almost looks like the Terminator tire. 
So they must have had the same company that did that working uh, technology to do their commercial. Uh, so that's a new tire that you'll start seeing. So if you get one that looks like two thin tires with a big wide groove down the middle of the grand seam, right away you're looking for a Goodyear Aquatrade. It will not be original equipment. It's going to be replacement. Because of the cafe requirements, that one just slightly under the cafe requirements, I guess. Although it, it's a great tire, according to Goodyear, it provides excellent traction. The rolling resistance isn't as low as it is in some other tires. Okay, we're going to take a look at uh, a video, a short video. Uh, TV Ontario uh, has a program called uh, the Acme School of Stuff. And they made a trip. <laughs> they made a trip to um, a, a wheel alignment shop. And one of the guys that I work with, he, he taped this for me. He said, Lauren, there's a real good little show on last night. I thought you'd find it interesting because it talks about you know, wheel bases and, and front end lines and stuff like that. So I thought I'd bring along the show to you. exciting. As a matter of fact, I had a car built like this. And at least it felt like it was built like this. Over the last 20 years, cars have steadily gone faster and straighter down the road with more comfort and traction and less vibration and noise. My ordinary sedan of the 80s easily outhandles my sports car from the 60s. It's been a sneaky revolution. I didn't fully realize how much cars had changed until I visited a wheel alignment training center. I was asking about front end alignment. They quickly brought me up to date by shouting at me. While the exact alignment of the front wheels is still important, the rear wheel alignment has to be taken into account as well. Let's go back to the 60s for a second. The reasons for proper wheel alignment haven't changed. Good handling and tire life. But changes in tire technology have led to most of us riding around town on $1,000 worth of rubber. So the incentive for proper alignment is greater. The front wheels of a vehicle can't be perfectly perpendicular in all planes. To counteract forces at highway speeds, the tires are pointed inwards a bit. It's called toe-in. When toe-in set correctly, the tires will point straight ahead when the vehicle's moving. Now, incorrect toe wears tires. Camber is similar to toe-in, but in another plane. It's the tilt from the up and down perpendicular. Incorrect camber settings cause pulling in one direction and tire wear. The third biggie is caster. You can study the effects of caster by studying a caster. The fact that this shaft is set back makes the wheel follow the direction of travel. It's the caster on a car that returns the steering to the center when you let go of the wheel. Caster works tilted forwards or backwards. Some vehicles specify a slight forward caster for power steering and a slight backwards caster for manual steering. The effect of wrong caster is wild handling from too little and hard steering from too much. Incorrect caster is the only situation that doesn't wear tires. Now, when all of this is correct, the car will still veer off the road, but it's not the car's fault. Roads are curved for water runoff. A proper alignment will compensate for that. The compensation can be done with toe-in, but it's preferable to tweak the caster settings because caster doesn't affect tire wear.
biggest changes to vehicles have been the proliferation of front wheel drive and unibody construction. These cars no longer have frames and the individual wheel components are bolted to the body. This makes the integrity of the body part of the alignment. understand the concept that the rear wheels actually control the direction of the car and the front compensates for the rear wheels so the inspection starts at the back of a car this is a McPherson strut it's found now in most cars the upper end of the strut is bolted to the body shaft on a sideways engine is shorter than the other, that wheel gets power a little later than the one with the longer shaft. To compensate for that effect, the wheel with the shorter drive shaft is set back on the car a bit. Also, smaller cars have smaller wheels that have to turn faster, so the alignment biz is getting pretty high tech.
Uh, vehicle track identification. Uh, this is just a list of some of the things that I think we can record as far as dimensions go from tires to the crime scene. And you may also think of a few others, I've admitted, but one of them is wheelbase. So we can get the wheelbase in some cases, in some cases we can't. Depending on how good of impressions are left at the crime scene. Sometimes we can get wheelbase and front track width, or maybe just front track width. Measure the rear track width as well. The rear track width, whenever it's available, we usually have less problems recording it than the front track width. I'll explain that later. The front track width, the tires are, are pivotal and they can turn left or right, therefore it affects the track width. And the perpendicular distance between the front tracks when you're measuring them, when a vehicle's been making a turn at a crime scene. So if you do some tests yourself, you'll, you'll find that that's the case. And today, we'll even, we can even do that. When we're out doing some measurements today, we'll, we'll just uh, cut the tires and do a turn and take a measurement of the front track with your information. Arc width, that's how wide the tread is for each tire. That's another measurement we can get. And turning diameter. It's one not too often recorded, but it's very easy to record. And in some cases can provide some assistance. Especially if you haven't got the wheelbase. If you weren't able to get the wheelbase because the vehicle just turned in and made a very hard turn through an area and drove back out again. When you're measuring turning diameter, doesn't always mean that you've got the minimum turning diameter the vehicle is capable of, but it could eliminate vehicles that aren't capable of turning as tightly as what you have measured. Um, for example, if you had a 34 foot, foot turning diameter at, measured at the crime scene, the vehicle may actually be able to go 32 and didn't have its wheels fully cut. But a vehicle with, say, at least two or three feet more, something about 38, a minimum of a 38, foot turning diameter, you wouldn't have been able to make that 34. So that's the point I was making there. You might be able to eliminate some larger vehicles, basically, like large trucks or full-size vehicles as opposed to a small Suzuki sidekick or something like that. The tread depth, once again, if you can measure that, the non-skid depth, that may help you uh, rule in or rule out a vehicle. So the more of these factors you can get, the more scientific your evaluation, because it's all based on recorded data. So whenever possible, base your opinions and conclusions on as much recorded data as you can get. You're less likely to uh, run into problems, and you're more likely to have a, you know, a more restricted opinion, in other words, being able to eliminate vehicles that don't fit. Also, tire circumference is another one that you may be able to get. I don't think I have on there. That's the one where you have a transfer pass that keeps repeating itself or quite a noticeable chunk out of the tire. You may be able to record it from that. So you may get the turning diameter. And also another one that you might be able to get in some cases would be the distance between two tread wear indicators, two wear bars, if you can see them showing up. Uh, and in a crime scene impression for a ball tire, well, make sure you measure that distance. Don't just rely on your photograph to get it. I think I'd actually physically measure it at the scene in case you have very slight enlargement problems. I'll just run through a few of these things. Okay, so once again, we've got the wheelbase from the center to the center when we're measuring the vehicle. And the track width is from center, from right to left, center to center, front and rear. Okay, so the turning diameter, as I mentioned, is going to be this yellow marker here, yellow line is going to be for the front tire. It's going to be curve to curve, turning diameter. 
curb to curb for the outside front tire. We're going to measure it by stretching a tape across from one side to the other. And then at right angles, straight down and using simple trigonometry, we should be able to get a measurement. Turning diameter, you're actually, that's only where you actually are going to be measuring the outside of yep. the track. Yep. We're going to measure from the outside edge here to the outside edge there, or you could go from the inside edge to the inside edge. Wouldn't make much difference. I usually go outside edge to outside edge. Right. You know, you can measure center to center, a case like that. Okay? And you can pick any spot along here. Won't matter. Take the tape and get a get the person to hold one end and then slide it along until it meets exactly. And take a spot like an even number, like 30 feet, 40 feet. Something you can divide by two easily. 34 feet, you know, pick an even number. Don't make a 34 and uh, 34 and 5 eighths inches or something like that. Pick it exactly on an even number. And that's just by swinging the tape until the 34 foot mark. This end is held. You just swing the tape till the 34 foot mark exactly cuts the outside edge. Okay? <coughs> I mentioned uh, when you're recording the wheelbase, you can get the approximate wheelbase by estimating where the rear tire stopped and measuring to where the front tire stops. The distance from the center to where the impression stops and the center of the front to where the impression stops is pretty close for front and rear tire. So it works out pretty good. And for a situation where the vehicle is sinking into dirt like I mentioned before, if it sinks in a little bit less at the rear or more at the front, try and estimate the depth there and go up that amount and forward to there and get an approximate wheelbase for occasions where a vehicle sinks into dirt. case where uh, simulated where a vehicle drives straight in, backs up and cuts its wheels and backs up that way. So we're going to be center to center, center to center, front to, center, front to rear. Okay, so that's the type of tracks we're going to try and make today. In the dirt. to the wheelbase when the front tires are turned. Okay, I found that by measuring the inside leading edge to the inside leading edge that there was less error introduced in measuring the wheelbase. Now if a vehicle pulls in and its tires are perfectly straight, the front tires, and then they back out like that and then turn, you can pretty well measure anywhere, you know, from a spot on the rear to a spot on the front, and be very close. But when you cut the front tire, front front tires, turn the steering wheel to the left. This corner is going to move back, you know, out and back a bit. So if you measure it from where the tire stopped back here to this spot, it sh should come out shorter than the actual wheelbase. If you go to the inside leading edge of this right rear corner and measure to this edge here, you can see this corner hasn't really dropped back as far. Now it may not seem like much, but it can make a difference of, of three or four inches in a tire that, that's fully turned cracked. And I think that um, that is a problem that sometimes occurs when people are measuring um, 
wheelbase measurements and getting different results. And they say, like, we don't, we're not getting much consistency in doing it. I think it's because there's no uh, pattern to how they measure. They don't always consistently measure from the best spot. Uh, I noticed this fairly early on when I was recording measurements, uh, vehicle track measurements, and, and doing some tests in newly fallen snow and recording uh, wheelbase measurements. I noticed that where you measure from, you get different answers. Now, if I go to the other side of the vehicle, and the tire is cut hard, and I can see it because it's been twisted and turned, and I measure to the outside edge, it's going to be longer than the wheelbase. So, for certain vehicles, if you were to pick the outside uh, left here, uh, you could get 112 inches, and if you were to go to the right side of the vehicle, the tire is cut like this, you could get like 121 inches. You get a difference like nine inches from one side to the other, just depending on where you took the measurements from. But if you measured the inside leading edge, you would find that you wouldn't be off the actual wheelbase measurement as much. So we'll uh, take a look at that. That's an example of a spindle assembly. Tire is actually mounted on the spindle, which can move back and forth just like your wrist when the tires are turned. So this tire can, can move back and forth, affecting the wheelbase measurement. Has anybody ever taken any tests or done any measurements like that? Tried it? See? Okay, perhaps we'll do that today when we're outside then. This is what uh, we're going to attempt today. <coughs> Measuring the wheelbase for the, with the front tires turned, we can try that. I use a straight edge. I, I actually have a long, thin aluminum uh, blade that was off of a cement trowel. I use that and I've got it honed up in the edge. I press it down into the sand dirt or snow and make an indentation. We can use a ruler. We've got these rulers here today. So this will be represent the rear tire here. This represents the front tire. The front tire has been turned and the shoulder, the edge is usually not nice and square. It's usually rounded off. What I'll do is I'll, I'll find a spot by looking very carefully at the ground where the tire has come to a complete stop and left of an impression as far ahead as I can find. And I'll go at right angles to the direction of travel of the tire, and I'll press it in the snow or the sand. And leave a, a line like that. And I'll go right along the inside edge, right on the edge of the rib, the most outer edge of the tire. Press it right there. This is on the inside edge here. Okay, on the inside the rib, right on the edge of it. Press it in, and I'll get it next crossing right there. So for the front tire, I have to go not parallel to this, but at right angles to the direction of travel, as close as I can guess, and as far ahead as I can see a little indentation in the sand, and I'll press this ruler at right angles and make a, a line in the sand, and I'll go along the inside edge, right on the edge, and, and at right angles or parallel to the center rib or groove, and I'll press that in and I'll get it next right there. So I've squared off the corner here and the corner here to now measure the distance. I'll ask the person assisting me to hold the zero on the tape right on that spot. And I'll watch them when they do it to make sure that they do it. Now if I didn't have this spot, the person could pick anywhere along here to hold the tape. They could hold it over here, they could hold it here, any back here, because that, that's where they see it stopping right there. So. If they don't realize how particular you are and how accurate you're trying to get, they could plunk that thing down anywhere. So you give them this spot and show them that you want to hold it right there, and then they, they plunk the zero end on the tape down right there. Make sure when you're looking at the tape, you know where zero is, because different tapes differ. These ones have a little metal clip that flicks out right on zero, and you can drive it into the ground, the one we're going to use today. So we'll stretch it, and we'll take the reading right out of that spot. That will be a wheelbase for one side. If we're fortunate enough to get the wheelbase for the other side, we'll go to the inside edge and do the same thing, and we'll measure that, and we'll get a proximate wheelbase for both sides, and they'll be different. They'll probably vary by about an inch or two inches. Then we're going to average them. They'll both be fairly close. 
This one might be one inch longer, two inches longer. This one might be one inch less. And in some cases, this one might be right on. This one might be a little shorter or a little longer. It depends on the, the steering mechanism of the vehicle in question. I found some, you don't always get consistent results is what I found, depending on the vehicle the way the front end set up. So we'll take an average and we'll get an uh, approximate wheelbase. And uh, under good conditions where you can see where the tires have stopped, you'll probably be within two inches, plus or minus two inches. When we do a search with the computer, we always go plus or minus two inches on the wheelbase. We don't go right on. Now for the track width, we can measure center here to center there and get a rear track width. For the front tires, we could measure where they stop. You cannot measure straight across here. We could measure straight across here. We could go back a ways and hold the tire, the tape at right angles. But we cannot do that for the front tires when they're turned like that. They're coming in at an arc because the tires, the tracks they leave are actually closer together than the actual wheel base. Because the tires are able to turn, and when the tires turn, the tracks they leave become closer together than when they're straight. Does that, does that make sense? You know, for some people who have never done the test, it may not. If these tires are nice and straight, the front tires, or if you can see where the vehicle has been backing up in a straight line with the front tires, you can go back. You don't have to be at the leading edge to get a turn. As long as the front tires are running parallel. This is an example of what uh, sort of simulate what I'm talking about. Supposing these are the two front tires. Okay. Okay, now you can see the distance between those two tires, from center to center here. Now, as I turn the tires, the more I turn them, you can see the space between here narrows. And as I turn it back, it widens. So that's basically what's happening to the track city. Okay? So that's why. That's why when it. When a vehicle is making a turn, you cannot measure across at right angles again. It will always be less than the actual front track width, and it will always be of no value for calculating the vehicle. Anytime you've got measurements from a vehicle and the front track width is much shorter than the rear, you can get suspicious that this is what's happened when the person took the measurement. In other words, the rear track width is 58 inches and the front track width is 47 or something. You know, 10 inches shorter. You know, you know, chances are there's an error in reading the front track list. So the first question I ask is, was the vehicle in a turn when you took that measurement? And invariably, the answer is yes. There are rare cases when you know you'll get a vehicle that's been really modified, and the rear end is quite, quite refined. But if somebody says, no, I I know about this front track width problem, and I'm satisfied that the tracks were fairly straight and everything. This situation, when you measure the front track width across here, from leading edge to leading edge, uh, unfortunately, you don't always get uh, the exact track width here either, even though you're going from the very tip to the very tip, because of the problem in locating that exact edge and also one tire turning a little bit more than another. When you crank your wheels, both tires don't turn exactly the same amount because they're making different arcs. So the engineer set it up so that the tires do not exactly turn the same way. But you can get very close to the front track width that way. If you go leading edge to leading edge, you're going to be very close, but uh, probably a little bit narrower, maybe. Half an inch narrower, something like that. That can happen with the tests I've done. So you may want to not put too much weight on it in a situation like that. Okay, now this is the scenario of different ways to measure vehicle stands. We've got the recommended method of center to center, <coughs> because that's what the manufacturer's measurement is, and if we measure the same as them, we're more likely to get close. And also, I find it easier to locate the center of a tire than the outer edge because of the problems with trying to define what is the edge of a tire that's worn on the shoulder. 
And we can do it by measuring inside to inside plus the width of the tire, outside to outside minus the width of the tire. Outer to inner and inner to outer will give you the same thing as center to center. So any of those techniques is acceptable to come up with the track width. And you can measure more than one just to cross-reference and check yourself. Up to 19, from 71 to 1989, there are measurements in there for dual wheel vehicles. But in the computer program that Michigan has for 1990, 91, 92, we don't have dual wheel pickup measurements in there. They're hard to get. It's hard to get the truck stats as opposed to the car stats. The car database is quite good, but the vans and trucks, those measurements aren't uh, published like the car ones. So they're a little harder to come by. You have to go to the truck manufacturer and, and ask them to supply it to you. So Jado Dynamics, a company that gets the data, has a harder time getting it. And Michigan State Police, when they were collecting it, had a harder time getting truck stats. Yeah. But, yes? Oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, when you're talking about that, you say the vans and pickup, standard pickup trucks are not in there? Yeah, they're in there. But not as complete? Not as complete. There may be some of them missing. But nevertheless, it's still pretty good. I mean, there's a pretty darn good database of truck data in there. Yes, it's quite complete, but there might be the odd one missing, especially for the newer trucks, for 90, 92, 93, 94. Well, not 94, those ones. But when they come out, they're likely, we're going to have a harder time getting them. So, for, so if you do a search and you see a 1990 uh, truck on there, Ford F-250, don't rule out 1991 and 92 or 93 because it's not on the list. It's probably because we don't have the data on it. So, and also, if, if you've got like, uh, oh, the 1988 Ford Crown Victoria on the list, 1986, 1988, 1989, and 87 is missing, it, it could be the 87. We're just missing the specs for that year. Because if 86 showed up, 87, 88, 89, chances are 87 didn't change any. We just didn't have the specs in there. You may see that the odd time. So don't necessarily restrict, restrict yourself to a year. When, we, when you get a printout, you'll often get the same vehicle coming out for 10 years because it hasn't changed. The frame hasn't. Just the body stock changed. And the frame stays the same. So when you get 175 hits, that doesn't mean 175 hits. There, there might only be 15 vehicles on there, just repeating over and over. And also, we started collecting tire size. Uh, tire size uh, for the vehicles and um, a few other little factors like that. So you get the same vehicle showing up, like a 1990 um, Nissan pickup. It might be there four times, that one vehicle, with three different tire sizes. And, uh, and a different uh, other measurement, like a two-door or four-door cab or something. The same vehicle as possible. For um, dual-wheel vehicles, the measurement used by the manufacturer is center of one dual to the center of the other dual. So if you, if you do have a dual-wheel pickup truck, I'm not saying you can't find out what that vehicle is. Let's face it, it's a lot easier to go to a manufacturer and get specs on a pickup truck than to go around and get a bunch of cars. So you could go to Ford and GM and say, look, this is the center to center rear track width I have. From the center of one dual to the other, and here's my front track width. Can you tell me what the vehicle might be? And give them a wheelbase, and they might be able to let you know. Because there aren't very many of these vehicles around. Did someone in this class say they ran across a dual wheel car? No, I don't think so. Okay, that was another class I had. Apparently there's a car out there that has dual wheels on the grid. I think it's Japanese. Uh, it's not in our database anyway. So, um, measure from there to there on the dual wheels. And we do have some dual wheel vehicles in, like 1989 and older. Here's some of the reasons that we can run into some problems and not have a vehicle show up. 
that video we just saw, they talked about camber. So if the camber is tilted out or tilted in a little too much, if we've got a front end alignment problem, we might not get a hit, or we might have to go quite a bit wider to get a hit. That's why the closest vehicle on the computer list to what you measured at the scene isn't always the best one. It might be one that's, you know, further off what you measured that it actually was the vehicle because you have these alignment problems. Toe in or toe out as well. If you have toe in or toe out, it can also affect your track width a little bit. But the camber one would be more likely to, to make a, a bigger difference. How much effect is the rear wheel uh, alignment? Yeah. Um, I'm, I can't say it for sure, because I don't know, but I would suspect that the rear wheel alignment would have less effect. I don't think the adjustments to the, to the rear end are as great as the front end adjustments that they can make. Real heavily on the rear and see what to do with the problems. They couldn't get a live drive. Which one's that? The Buick Century. Uh, Buick Century. 84. Did they say what the uh, problem was? Like yeah. toe, a toe, or a toe in a toe? They didn't they? Buick Century? I don't think the alignment uh, adjustments are as great on the rear of the vehicle. Although, you know, if they're off, they can certainly have probably a drastic effect on your tire wear. It does, takes very little. Uh, alignment problems that cause tire wear. Um, but uh, the front end, because of the tires have a steering function, there's there's more adjustments that can be made. So um, these are some of the measurements. Anyways, uh, I was saying, when I do a search, I usually have a shorter list of the ones that are closest to, and I generally, like for a serious case, I generally run a second list with much wider specs. Like I'll go an inch and a half, sometimes up to an inch and a half on the track widths, and uh, four to six inches on the wheelbase, plus or minus, to give them a longer list and say, okay, this is your short list that's close, but here's another bunch of vehicles that are in the ballpark. Don't, you know, don't exclude them in case there's uh, errors in measurements or alignment problems and all that. So that's what I usually do. The second list is more like an investigative aid. If they come up with a suspect, is he on the list, is his vehicle close, that kind of thing. Discussion. If you change the tire on a rim to a, a different width of the tire, slightly different width, it's really not going to affect the center to center track width because the tire will be displaced to an equal amount on either side of the rim if you can put a slightly bigger tire on a vehicle. Or if it happens to be a lower profile tire that's a little bit wider, lower and wider profile, really won't affect the track width. But once you, once you change the rim, then you will shift the center point of the tire and affect the um, track width. So if people change their rims and they reverse their rims, like Gary was mentioning earlier, it's, it's certainly going to affect the the recommended specifications from the manufacturer for that vehicle. Anybody have any experience with that any, on any vehicles? Well, you see them all over in Santa Ana. Yeah. <laughs> so it's fairly common? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and uh, that's probably uh, worth mentioning as well. It's more common with trucks than it is with cars, I'm, I'm told. No, it's more common. <laughs> <laughs> um, according to uh, people in the automotive industry, um, the cars, let's say a new car coming off the factory, it tends to have less variety of rims available for it. Okay, now maybe once you get it out and people want to modify it by going to tire shops, that's different. But coming out of the factory, uh, trucks have more variety of rims available for them than do 
cars. Cars usually only have two sizes of tires recommended by the manufacturers now that they recommend you put on. But of course, anybody can, can do things with their vehicle, jack up the rear end, and modify. So here, it's quite common to. Well, uh, certain certain parts of <laughs> yeah. probably San Bernardino too. They have uh, yeah. low riders and uh, yeah. gangbangers, and they do a whole lot of strange things with their suspension. Okay. All right. So you know, you may you may be your measurements certainly, if you can get them, your wheelbase and track width will certainly be helpful. But um, it won't necessarily, uh, you know, maybe get you something on a computer printout. So we're saying. But when you recover the vehicle and you measure it and you're real close, that's always nice and gratifying. But if you're going to measure these um, measurements at a crime scene, I think this is a good exercise today that we're going through. But maybe <coughs> actually go out there and practice and take a look at some of the problems that we do encounter. Um, okay, on a turn, as I mentioned, the front track width. The rear track width, the tires are fixed except for four wheel steering vehicles. And there's only two of those on the market. They're not that common right now. I don't know if they're going to catch on or not. It costs extra to get four wheel steering on the Japanese vehicles that provide it and hasn't really caught on. I don't know if it's going to. But the rear tires can turn slightly on four wheel steering vehicles, so it could affect the track width slightly on the rear, but not as much as the front. The tires will not turn like the front tires. They only turn a small amount. Um, so the rear track, you can usually get it by measuring center to center on a turn. But the front track width, as I said, when the tires are turned, the perpendicular distance is much less than if we went from this, we went this way, from center to center, which is very close. You can see that distance is a lot longer than this distance. So when a vehicle has made a sharp turn like that, forget about the front track width. I'm trying to measure it at right angle. Just quickly, once again, uh, I mentioned what arc width was. Try and get the arc width in the crime scene impression if you can. It's very helpful to tire companies, especially if you're mailing a photograph of a tire like uh, Steve had yesterday off to a company and asking them if that's their tire or not. They, they, they'll usually get back to you and ask for how wide was that impression. If you don't have a ruler in there, you know, it will confuse them. But you're better to actually give them the measurement and say, this is a photograph of the tire we recorded at a crime scene. Can you recognize the pattern? If you do, would you please get back to us? And what I do is I send out letters to about 11 companies, and 11 of the major companies, and I say uh, a negative reply is not required. So if they don't recognize the tire, they know that they don't have to go to any work. But somebody, if they look at it and say, hey, yeah, I, that's one of our tires, they'll want to know the width because then they can tell you, you're probably looking at this size, and it was original equipment on these vehicles, that kind of thing. Um, thread depth, again, once again, or learn to get depth. Um, so I'm terminology once again here. Design or non-skid depth, from the top of the tread to the base of the deepest groove, is the design or non-skid depth. The under tread is the distance from the bottom of the groove to uh, the belt plies. Okay, so that's the under tread. So that's why the tire industry probably doesn't call it the tread depth. Because the full tread depth to them would be from here all the way down here. So this is the design depth or non-skid depth in the under tread. So if you can measure that at the crime scene, Remember, it's not always the same for each groove. It can vary across. So if you have four grooves going across, and you can measure all four, you might find the tires getting worn thinner on the left side than the right. So you might say it's 8.30 seconds in the first groove, six, four, and then two. Measuring it across, if you can get that. Does anybody need that on any longer? Okay. Leave that for that's a good schematic of all kinds of components for the tire. There's those lugs that we were talking about yesterday on the snow tire. Uh oh, I turned all the lugs out again. Well, 
Well, they tell us when we're uh, lecturing that you're not supposed to leave that overhead on when you uh, take a projection off because you've got this blaring white screen in front of you. <laughs> don't usually work under these. Yeah, don't usually work because they work in pitch black. <laughs> Uh, okay, this is the measuring the turning diameter. Measurements taken from the outer edge of the arc made by the outer edge of the most fun tires. Uh, this is what we'll do in the larger parking lot. We'll go over there and we'll take a vehicle and we'll make a really tight turn. Then we'll lay down a line across here, X to X prime. And we'll try and make it a nice even number, like 30 feet or whatever suitable, depending on the size of the vehicle. Then at the very center, if this is 30 feet, hold it there and swing this tape until the 30 foot mark just touches the outside edge. We will go to 15 feet, which is the exact center. And when we use the second tape, and go to the outside edge and run at right angles to that 15 foot mark and we'll get a reading. So, with a simple formula, a little high school mathematics here, the turning diameter is B squared, <coughs> B squared divided by A plus A. That's all. So you just need a little calculator. No, you B squared divided by A plus A. You've got your turning diameter. Okay, so this is B, which is one half of this line, and this is A. So you can see it's pretty quick, simple thing to do. That'll give you a turning diameter. We'll see how close we come. Yes? So what is what does D actually mean? What are you actually saying? And you say 10.75 meters. Um, that is the turning diameter of the vehicle. That's the, uh, the um, tightest circle that the vehicle can make the diameter of that turn. From outside to outside. Mm -hmm. That's right. From outside to outside, that vehicle could turn in an area that was 10.75 meters wide. So it's, you're actually figuring out the diameter of this circle. You know, if, the, if the, the manufacturer, he takes the vehicle and does a due test, there's a vehicle cut as hard as it can, and they make a complete circle, and then they, they measure that turning down. Because people want to know, you know, like, how uh, maneuverable is this vehicle in a tight area? For some people that's important, and the manufacturers, the engineers, it's an important uh, measurement or specification for a vehicle. So a Suzuki Sidekick will have a much smaller turning diameter than a Cadillac, full-size Cadillac, or a Ford F10. And you know, a Suzuki Sidekick, I don't know like what size tires they take, but you can get the same type of tires on a, on a much larger truck that you might end up with on a Suzuki. You know, so. Turning diameter might be helpful. If you have the wheelbase already, it's not going to be of much help, because the longer the wheelbase, the wider the turning diameter, the smaller the wheelbase, the smaller the turning diameter. So if you already have a good wheelbase measurement, the turning diameter is not going to help you out very much. Okay? Because the wheelbase, <laughs> wheelbase is more accurate, uh, I find. And yes, Susan. <laughs> is, um, is B the, the whole length of the line? No, it's half the length of the line. So it's from like point C to the... Um, yes. X to X prime is the full line, and B is, is one half of that line. So using trigonometry, that's all it is. We know two sides, and we can just plug this formula in. And that'll give you your training then. There's, an, there's another formula for arriving at the same thing, but this is the simplest one I've seen. There's more than one way to calculate this from these measurements. But I think that's the, that's the simplest one. So what we're going to do is we're going to take those measurements from the crime scene and we are going to plug them into a computer program because the question is, okay, we've measured these measurements, Does, do the measurements just have to sit in a file folder or can we use them as an investigative aid? Don't confine ourselves necessarily to what we get. But are there some vehicles out there that we should be looking at more than others? And the answer is yes, and, and a computer can, can tell you that. Yeah. <clears throat>
going to get uh, Karen to copy this for us. It's just one sign. So if you can make uh, about 13 copies of that. I don't think Roger Bohal's in mind giving me this information because I've talked to Roger. Uh, East Lansing Police Department, very progressive people. And an excellent forensic department. At any rate, um, they were the first ones in North America to develop a vehicle track database on a computer. In England, they've been using this for quite a long time too. I don't know if they go back longer than Michigan or not. Michigan started in 71, collecting the stuff. And they did all their searches manually back then, and then they computerized and go to 81. And uh, at all, at about five or six labs, I think, in England, their major labs, they have a vehicle track program where investigators can measure measurements at a scene and get them from the lab. And now in Canada, we have a copy of the program in Ottawa, one in Nova Scotia, and one in Alberta, regionally serving investigators that record measurements. Last year for Canada, we ran 208 searches on the system, and we had uh, several cases where it was a, a value. It doesn't solve the case on its own, but it provided a good investigative lead. Most of the times when the vehicle was recovered, we did a survey, 22 times uh, uh, the vehicle was on the computer list. We had 23 times when they actually recovered the vehicle out of 65 people I surveyed. We recovered 23 vehicles from the crimes. 22 times it was on, once the vehicle wasn't on the computer list. One of those two lists I sent out, the short one plus the long one, I'm counting both those lists. The guys were able to say, okay, we got the vehicle, it was on that list. Sometimes the list helped them and sometimes the investigators had the vehicle without necessarily the list doing much good because just their investigations turned up this person, not necessarily the list. But in some cases, the list was the clue, you know, for them to get suspicious because a, a neighboring detachment would arrest somebody and the information would be, would be shared. And they say, well, we had a break in a week ago and the vehicle was a such and such truck. What were these guys driving? And they'd say, well, they were driving that truck too go interview and take a statement and find out if they were involved. So there's little spin-offs like that. So that's the address right there, Department of State Police, Forensic Science, 214 South Harrison Road, East Lansing, Michigan. There's the phone number. Roger Bullhouse is your contact person. So everybody has a copy of that now? If you get to the crime scene, the tire tracks are not very good for measuring wheelbase and track width. In other words, you cannot see where they end. You can see where the, the rear track ends, but the front track's driving up onto grass or a hard packed ground and gravel, and you can't see where it ends. Don't measure. Okay? Make a note that you, I would quickly record that. Uh, and Examination was made of these tire tracks, however, they are unsuitable for wheel-based measurements because we can, I cannot see where the front and rear end in order to accurately measure. You make a quick note of that, but if you can't see track width properly, wheel-based, don't measure it. Don't, don't put too much guessing into the whole thing. But in, if you're lucky enough to get stuff where you can see where things end, then measure it. Yes. Will you or Roger also search on things where we don't have, uh, where we just have track width? Yes. I mean, obviously you're going to get a longer list. Let's right. But we will, if you, if you just have the rear track width, the vehicle's backed up off the edge of the road, left some good clear rear tracks and dump something, and you measure center to center very carefully, you're going to have a long list probably, but you're probably going to get that vehicle on that list somewhere. Just like we did for that underground parking lot that Monte Carlo was on the list, but we had 363 vehicles on there. But when, when we did come across a suspect vehicle, we were able to look and say, yeah, that's on the list. 
Uh, and then you look at the tire. So you got two factors. There. So, so you give the investigator two things to look at. But um, we will do searches if you only have wheel base and if you only have track front or rear. But like you said, the respondents will be considerably more. That's the vehicle track experiment form we're going to use. That's a good form to use if you're training somebody. It only takes a half an hour for you to take a new employee out and show them how this is done. It would probably take a half an hour if you know where you're going, a spot picked out. But make the tracks, make the measurements. It would say it takes half an hour. And then you can measure the vehicle up. You don't even have to run the search. You can measure the vehicle afterwards without knowing firsthand what the measurements are. Measure it afterwards and say, okay, there's how close we were. Give you an idea, this is how to do it. So that's a form that can be used. And you can also, if you want to run it through the computer system and ask Roger to send you a printout, he can. This is a little training exercise we have for our people in Canada that are new in IDET. We get their trainer to take them out on a day when it's quiet and do these measurements. And then they send the request to me in Ottawa. I run the search for them. And then they let me know whether it was on the list or not. So it checks the integrity of our database, the quality of their measurements. It's good feedback. It's a, it's a training exercise we have for the understudy program, which in our force lasts for about one year for new people getting into forensics, uh, fingerprint for fire and application. Crime scene vehicle track form that I mentioned. I'll put this up just for a second. Okay, so there's some of the things that are worth measuring at the crime scene. Caption date, family location section you're working for, assistance, then you got your wheelbase, track width, returning diameter if you want to measure it, your front tire information, rear tire, right front, left front, right rear, left rear, any observations you want to make. Just as a reminder, that's on the back of the form. What is wheelbase? What about when the tires are turned up? What is uh, turning diameter and track width? And then we've got the suspect vehicle examination form. This is basically related to vehicle measurements and tires. It's not to do with other things like collecting fiber evidence or anything like that. But it's got you know information on the case again and the vehicle, the type, the make, the model, the year, license, the state, the serial number, wheelbase, and track width that you measured right off the vehicle. Because it might be an alignment problem with this vehicle. And then your tire information for the tire, and don't forget to check, you know, things like skid depth if you have it. Uh, trend depth here, and the mold number, serial number, and also the spare tire. And finally here, that's the back of that form. Just a little information on, you know, things to measure and the turning down. Lights on. Are there any questions on that? Yes. Uh, on this uh, crime scene, tire, and vehicle track form, you have an area that says uh, mud, snow, tire, all season, or summer tire. Mm -hmm. How do you tell the difference between an all season and summer tire? Well, if you, if you can't tell the difference, I, I wouldn't put it in. Uh, you know, you could just leave it blank. But the pattern, the pattern is different for an all-season type tire. So you have to begin to get pretty familiar with pattern. You have to look at that tread design guide book. You have to get familiar with an all-season type design. And uh, I could show you some in that tread design guide book. They tend to have uh, grooves running out to the side from the center. That's the all-season? The all-season. The early all seasons had a narrow center rib and they had grooves running out to the side laterally so that the water could flow off and it provided good traction. 
and the uh, summer type tires tend to have ribs running around broken up into elements and don't necessarily have uh, that type of design. Okay, so this, this here is an all-season type design. It's got elements and it's got grooves running out and it's got a solid center rib. And some all-season designs have a groove right down the middle, but they still have tread elements running laterally out from the center groove or the center rib. That's to allow good traction in snow, mud, and uh, rain for all, all year long. This one's called an all-winter radio, but it, it, it also has a lateral type groove pattern. So um, you may, if you don't know, um, just put radial type design, and you could put mud, snow, or radial type design. And like I say, you can change this form if you want. But generally, you can recognize an all-season pattern if you go through the tread design guidebook and look at a bunch of ones that are marked all season, you'll see they sort of have a characteristic look. This would be a summer radial type design right here. Okay, I think that covers pretty well all the information on the vehicle track identification. So we're going to, it's coffee time, we ran quite a bit over. So take a nice break now. Back. Fire track exercises and work with the computer. Let me just say thank you very much for having invited me down here. And uh, I haven't been able to answer all your questions necessarily because I certainly don't know everything there is to know about this subject. But I was really glad to have the opportunity to share information with you people. Um, I don't think that tire identification is anything that's above our ability to do as uh, forensic experts. I don't believe that we need necessarily um, tire engineers who design tires to do this work for us, although certainly we welcome their help and uh, they can provide a lot of information. But by sharing information like I have today from information that's been shared with me basically by tire companies and from cases I've worked on, um, I hope that you gain some information that you can find useful. And I feel confident that you people can do the job as good as I can. So good luck in working on tire identification. I've got some slides of a few interesting cases that I'll just run by you and uh, you may uh, see something interesting in them and also um, you know you may have some comments you want to make too in cases that you have. So you have my card if there's anything I can do for you in the future, questions I might be able to answer or maybe a uh, contact person that I uh, might have an entire company that might be able to help you out if you give me a call I'll certainly my little computer and see who I might know at that company and then you, you can call them directly or send them a letter. But certainly on serious cases they've been very helpful and that's the time to ask for their help because you've got a good reason. You're not just bugging them. Okay, so let's run through a few slides. And... Oh, I've got to turn the light on there. This is an example of a case where um, because of the workload in Saskatchewan, we are able to devote more time to some of this type of work, which allowed me the opportunity to de develop an expertise in tire identification that some of our people didn't have the chance to do because of the heavy loads that we have in different parts of the country. But in Saskatchewan, it wasn't that busy. I was able to attend minor offenses and collect whatever evidence I could. Now, a small community in Saskatchewan was being plagued by break-ins, and our local police department couldn't catch them with people, but they had a good idea who it was. And this offense involved a records yard where new vehicles that had been in accidents were brought in, and the tires were stolen off, and that they were of any value. So this person lost some other things, plus eight tires that were pretty good off vehicles. So this vehicle had its tires stolen. So this is an example of a fact where the trade design guide helped out. The person that owned these 
Rex didn't know what the make of the tire was. So I said, well, I'll, I'll make a cast of that impression there where the tire was sitting, and I'll look through the dread design guide, and I can probably tell you guys what type of tires were stolen, so you know what to look for if you're trying to see something. So I'll record the cast, dental stone, very quickly and easy to do. Mix it up with water, dump it in, look through the tread design guidebook. Located the tire in the book, pattern, name of Brunswick, looked up who makes Brunswick, Unirol Goodrich made Brunswick. Then they told us we also made tires for Sears and several other people with this exact same design on it. So we now had a picture of what the tire looked like and some possible names. The tires were then seized and test impressions were taken off and they were Sears tires with that design. The two tires, they had different wear. So these tires were actually seized from an individual and they were believed to have been on the vehicle. Test impressions, search, locate whatever areas we could. So we matched up the pitch sequence. You see the overlay, that's the cast. I think I've already showed you that photograph. So, this is a case where the test impression turned out to be slightly narrower than the actual cast. And remember I said when you make an impression on a hard flat surface, there's a little bit of pressure exerted by the sidewalls and the outer ribs, which narrows up the impression a little bit. So that would explain why it was a little bit wider on the cast than it was on the test impression. This is just an example of a truck tire that wasn't flat. Okay, once again, the serial number was helpful in locating the manufacturer for writing letters and also proving, you know, approximately when the tire was manufactured. Uh, the serial number wasn't of any use because it hadn't been recorded as far as that goes. The drawing design numbers. This is just an example of the pit sequence on this tire. It had, uh, no, that's okay. It had uh, A and B models on one side and C, C and D's on the other. We've seen that type of scenario before. Okay, that's an example of what the A model looked like. That's an example of what the B model looked like. And the C and 